All right, week six, global certification part two. Now, I hope you took advantage of looking at the video for part one plus the Hans Rosling um, video. It may have helped you better get a better grisp, grip of some of the issues. Now, here in part two, and if you haven't looked at that video, I really encourage you to go back to week five and look at it. We're going to look at global poverty and human development issues. Now, the human development issues often come, uh, come out of the WHO, the World Health Organization, but it's through a collaborative effort through a number of countries. And we're going to look at theories of global inequality, global inequality in the future, the two main areas of today's um, part two. And so when you think about theories of global inequality, we're going to look at, well, why does that exist? What perpetuates it? And where do we see global inequity in the future? So when you think in terms of this topic, some of the questions that might come to mind, especially if you've previewed the chapter, is, you know, what is modernization theory? That's one of the theories we're going to look at in terms of um, this inequity and global poverty. And what are its stages? Now, many of these theories will have stages or parts, if you will. How do conflict theorists explain the pattern of global stratification? What is the world systems theory? There are a number of theories we're going to look at, and part of this will help us understand these perpetuation of inequities. How is the new system of global trade affecting people in poor countries? So we're going to look at very briefly, really, um, what are some of, the, some of the features that are maintaining the world stratification the way that it is? Or what are some of the things that are making it better, or for that matter even, making it worse? And so what we're going to start with for part two then is looking at life expectancy, health, education, literacy, what those things are and how they impact global stratification. So that's what we're going to lead off with. Um, I will start posting some additional things in the weeks to sort of help you give additional information. For example, Gapminder does have uh, uh, um, some resources on life expectancy. I may just post a little something to help you understand what life expectancy is and how it's understood. It may not be exactly the way you think. All right, good luck and I hope you enjoyed this chapter. This is a, a significant chapter in sociology too when we start to branch it out into more of a global perspective. Good luck, everyone. Life expectancy. Now, I've done a couple of things in the week um, five folder, which I hope you'll have paid attention to last week, but it prepares for this. And that is I put in a video for, uh, by Hans Rosling and a PowerPoint by Gapminder regarding what is life expectancy, how is it calculated, so you have a better handle on it. So when we think in terms of you know, the life expectancy. If you notice on this particular table, look at the rank from one going down to 12 and then look at the, inter you know, the distribution down to 177. And if you look right across to the per capita or the gross um, uh, development product, um, you see that the higher you are in the rank, the higher you also are in the per capita in terms of income down to the lowest. Now, life expectancy has improved over time. Now, it also shows this, in the, this graphic here shows the relationship between income per capita and the health and the overall um, life expectancy of a nation. Now, this is what I've had posted for you already before. Life expectancy has improved over time and the average increase of about 30% in the past three decades and is now more than 70 years old on an average for life expectancy in 87 different nations. Now to remind you, in this particular graphic, the left-hand um, y-axis is life expectancy in years ranging from 50 up to uh, 85, and then along the bottom x-axis you see the uh, per capita. And you see the relationship between wealth and health. Now you'll find that in spite of this increase in many other uh, more in the more developed nations of life expectancy in some countries it's actually decreased decreased in some of the sub saharan african um, countries oftentimes the reasons for the decrease in life expectancy has less to do with um, 
um, you know, the natural conditions as much as it has to do with the degree of disease that can occur. Now some of the reasons that there's been some changes in life expectancy in different parts of the world has been in different parts of Africa. AIDS has been significant and has had an impact. High infant mortality rates around the world in lower income uh, countries. Uh, malnutrition of about a billion people um, in the world. Hunger, um, about nine million people die each year from hunger and 10 million children under the age of five die each year. So in spite of, and in fact, if we look at more current information, more current data, your textbook's not the most current reference to data, uh, we actually see that some of these things have changed over time and are actually better than what some of the older conditions suggest. So life expectancy has improved, and when you watch that PowerPoint, uh, it sort of walks you through a little bit about how to understand how is life expectancy calculated and to get a better perspective about where life expectancy is today. Now after life expectancy we can look at um, health. And health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now that's a particularly different shift and look at what is health. Health had long time been viewed as particularly the lack of disease or more the physicalness of our um, existence. The more, com the more rounded and more up-to-date version of what is defined as health includes social and mental well-being. Now there's 4.6 billion people who live in developing countries. 2.7 uh, don't have proper sanitation, 1.2 billion don't have clean water, and 12 million die from diarrhea, malaria, and tuberculosis. Now it puts in some perspective that certainly some parts of the world, particularly those that make less money per capita than the higher in, um, uh, and more developed countries, um, disease and illness uh, rank much higher. Despite these figures, the good news is that over the past 30 years, there have been improvements in life expectancy at birth, infancy, and child mortality and malnutrition. And again, so I would, I would encourage you to check out some of the Gapminder videos, particularly those done by Hans Rosling, to look at what are the more condition or more current view of the world in terms of uh, life expectancy, health, and as we'll look at here, education. Education is a fundamental uh, life chance in reducing poverty. It is considered the most important or primary life chance. Now one of the ways that they measure education around the world is through literacy and a person who can, re who can and with understanding uh, both read and write a short simple statement about their everyday life is considered literate and that rate is increasing dramatically as well. Now the rate is low in low income nations is about 50 percent lower than those and in high income nations. But the most current data is suggesting that this gap is starting to adjust and change. Women constitute about 66% of those who are illiterate. Now again, I'm going to emphasize this because it's a misnomer that a lot of these data that we see in texts that are perhaps not as up to date in terms of the data that it's expressing, like your text that you have for this class, that these data are older. That during your assignment, I hope that through going to the Gapminder site and reviewing more current data, uh, you'll see where some of this has been shifting and perhaps even more dramatically than you have imagined or thought. Now, one of the big areas that a lot of, you know, a lot of the international attention is brought to is this gender and equality issue. Women suffer more than men in a global inequity. Uh, real problems as it relates to families. Some of the elements associated with this would be that girls are less uh, desired generally than boys in lower income, but not exclusively around the world. Um, girls are more likely to drop out of school. They're more likely to receive less education. And they are paid less than men for the same work. Now, this has started to adjust with the amount of attention being drawn to what the role of women is in making improvements in families, particularly in lower income countries. 
So some of the progress that we have seen that between 1990 and 2001, the ratio of literate females has increased from 70 women to every 100 women to 81 women to, e to every 100 men. During that similar period of time, 1990 to the year 2000, girls in school rose from 66 girls to every 100 boys to 92 girls to every 100 boys. And we're seeing this as a, as a consistent and regular positive increase in what's occurring for uh, girls. Now with that comes some other benefits. Now you find this in your textbook and what you're looking at is uh, what happens when girls are educated, they tend to marry later, and there's many effects on the household as a result of that, and then the overall effect that it has on society. Girls with better education and how the effects are real. Girls marry later, they have fewer children, there's lower maternal uh, mortality rate, I'm sorry, and, uh, and they bring in much more needed income. Now you'll see this particular graphic here. I'll, um, I'm not going to leave it up a lot, but you can pause and look at it and read a little bit that's there regarding what the ripple effect is by um, educating girls who live in low-income um, circumstances. Now we're going to quickly review some of the theories that look at this issue of global inequality and how come it exists. We're going to look at modernization theory, dependency theory, world systems theory, and the new international divisions of labor theory. Now don't get too um, you know, upset or sort of, oh, more theory. And remember, these are just like you know, sunglasses. They, you know, different ways of looking at a very you know, common experience out there. So they have a slightly different view from each other about what explains this. Modernization theory, uh, this is a perspective that links global inequality to different levels of economic development and suggests that low income economies can move to middle and high income economy, economies uh, by achieving self-sustained economic growth. And what you're seeing here are some stages of which that can occur from traditional to takeoff to technologically maturity. Now, um, the most common reason for the lack of development is a, you know, is a traditional lifestyle that tends to be fatalistic in outlook. It's slow to change, um, they don't have a strong work ethic, and they can't save very much money. Now some of the critique to this particular you know, uh, theory is that it's particularly Eurocentric. Now when they talk about Eurocentricity, what they're meaning here is it has a particularly European um, outlook and view of things. It doesn't look at it from the perspective of those other countries that very strongly. Now, some Frank, argue, uh, Frank argues that there is a, a process of development of underdeveloped uh, as high income nations invest in, three in these countries and cause them to be dependent on them. That the more uh, higher income countries support lower income countries, these lower income countries become dependent. And so it sort of stifles their ability to um, uh, develop and gain a stronger foothold and moving in through the you know, middle income up to higher income countries. Now we consider dependency theory. Now this one here, the theme here is that rich countries have a vested interest in maintaining a, a dependent status with poorer countries, using them to gather raw materials to be manufactured in the rich countries. And we see this occurring all over the world, whether it's a country, for example, like China, who uh, purchases land in other countries like Africa to produce uh, growing fields for their own nation's benefit, not necessarily for Africa's benefit. And with dependency theory, um, there's a, the global poverty that can be at least partially attributed to the fact that the low-income countries have been exploited um, by the high-income countries. Uh, evidence for dependency theory can be best applied to the newly industrialized countries um, of Latin America. The theory aids us in understanding that the underdevelopment is a result both of one country's exploitation or exploiting as another 
as well as the transnational corporations exploiting new nations. So as nations become stronger and um, stronger eco economically, the higher income nations have a tendency to exploit those uh, nations by, by um, uh, taking advantage of the products that they can produce at a cheaper rate. Now some of the problems that exist is that the theory helps us to understand Latin America but not necessarily the Eastern Pacific countries, more in the Asia and some of the islands down in that area, who also receive aid, but have been experienced um, rapid growth like South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore. Estimates are that they will grow on average about 9% each year in the near future. And so the dependency theory um, has a fair number, a fair amount of weakness. If you have a theory that's you know labeled dependency, it suggests then that one country is dependent on another, and that's not necessarily going to be beneficial for that one that's dependent. Now, the third theory we'll touch on just briefly again will be world systems theory, and here the capitalist world economy is a global system divided into a hierarchy of three major types, if you will. There's core, there's peripheral, and there's semi-peripheral, in which upward and downward mobility is conditioned by the resources and the obstacles that characterize the international system. So the core, these are the dominant capitalist nations. Um, they have high levels of industrialization, high levels of urbanization. Now the thesis here is that the core nations, ex the core nations, they tend to exploit peripheral nations at their own expense, at the peripheral nations' expense. The semi-peripheral ones, well, they're more partially exploited, but they benefit more from the peripheral ones. And so there's a sort of a shared exploitation that occurs where some will benefit more than others. Um, it, if you will, it's very much uh, based on an interdependence. That is to say that. Um, com countries depend on one another, however, some tend to take more advantage of others and others can benefit and some don't benefit quite as well. The last one we're going to touch on is the new international division of labor. Now the thesis here is commodity productions are being split into fragments. So taking the way that we produce products, breaking it into smaller jobs, if you will, that can be assigned to whichever part of the world can best provide the most profitable combination of capital and labor, that is costs and people to do the work. And so with this particular one, we see more examples of smaller countries or countries with lower income taking, being taken advantage of um, because they, you know, they sell the labor of their um, laborers cheaper. They maybe don't have as many regulations, in particular around safety. You might remember in India the um, uh, sweatshops that were uh, burnt down to the ground because they were designed for six-story and five-story buildings and they added four and five new floors on them when they weren't physically able to withstand that, they were the places that were making the products for Joe Fresh. And so we see examples, and that's just, this is where this division of labor occurs. That the World Trade Liberalization Agreements have reduced many barriers uh, to the transfer of goods across the globe. These agreements don't benefit the poor nations as well. If workers ask for more money, the company will look to another country with more and cheaper labor. Uh, so the kinds of products that are taking advantage are labor is, is intensive and assembly oriented productions like uh, textiles, clothing, uh, technologically sophisticated exports like computers. Many of the companies that provide us with the things that we buy in North America are made in other parts of the world where Arguably, they're being taken advantage of, in part because they can provide some services and some products cheaper. Now, all of this is probably going to have a shift in terms of the different kinds of changes that can, cha uh, that can occur in political systems. So, for example, those of you who are more aware of what's going on around the world now, and you've been aware of the change of government in the United States, the kinds of things that Trump can do on the world stage regarding trade agreements, which he's talked quite a bit about, he's already pulled out of the, um, uh, the TTP and wants to renegotiate the NAFTA. 
So these renegotiations of trade and keeping things very close to the vest as the U.S. wants to be America first, this is going to have a ripple effect on how it affects these other countries and also how it will affect the United States. So some of the problems that exist is that nations don't, do not benefit from the external, as, but the external companies do. So the countries don't benefit as much as the companies do in this worldview. Results in the global com, uh, commodity change, a complex pattern of international labor and production processes that result in finished commodity ready for sale in the market, marketplace. And so, none of, you know, none of these particular theories are absolutely right, but they are different views on the same issue. And of course, this is a very dynamic issue because, like I said, even if there's a political change, not even just in the United States, as we're seeing it right now, but in any other part of the world, has a ripple effect on how this will play out. So when we consider, you know, sorry, this is your... Um, overview, you find this in your, in your textbook too, uh, but when you consider about the future, in many countries, economic process has sort of stalled at this point. That poor human development can be the result. It occurs more in the sub-Sahara Africa and Eastern Europe, more growth of the core nations at the expense of others, yet many countries have become industrialized and um, many others uh, will as well. You're seeing here uh, what are some of the newer industrialized com uh, countries. Uh, Mexico, Brazil, Turkey, India, South Africa, Thailand, China, Malaysia. You know, 20 years ago they weren't industrialized countries. And so they're newly industrialized and more countries are becoming more and more uh, industrialized. More growth on core nations at the expense of others. For example, coffee 1990 to 2005, coffee has sold more than uh, sold from 30 billion to 80 billion. This is the same coffee that's grown year in and year out, but the coffee sold has gone up. So the production of coffee has gone up. Income received by the producers has dropped from 12 billion to 5.5 um, billion. So as much as the sale of coffee has gone up dramatically. 30 to 80 billion. The money that the producers, the growers of coffee, has gone down from 12 to 5.5, which means the farmer gets less than one cent for every cup of coffee sold. So when you think in terms of the benefit to lower income countries, the U.S. doesn't make coffee. Canada doesn't make coffee. Uh, Turkey does. Uh, Guatemala does. Um, Jamaica does. There are coffees growing you know, you know, all over the world other than some of the more richer countries and some of these farmers are not getting the advantages as say Starbucks and Tim Hortons are who aren't paying for the coffee from, to the growers quite as they were. Some other issues. Combined uh, continued population growth, urbanization, environmental degradation. Well many countries have become industrialized and have started to improve their standards. So most nations start starting to recognize human rights. More people are educated. Incomes have begun to increase. And there's more education uh, for women and nations are having free elections. And so we start to see that the future could look a little brighter However, we don't know what implications, you know, changes in government will be and uh, we don't know in terms of companies, which companies will withdraw from what countries and start to emer emerge in other countries. So the future is really hard to determine, but it can have some positive outlooks when human rights are being expanded, there's income change for those who are of lower income countries and more education can all have a huge benefit to the um, lower income countries. Okay, there is the end of part two on global stratification. Let's keep on keeping on and carry on the good work. Bye now.